Hello viewers, welcome to the lecture on molecules of life. This is my second lecture and in my first lecture I had discussed the important elements which are present in molecules of life. And I had, I had also introduced you to the functional groups which are present in biomolecules and we found that these functional groups are responsible for the chemical and the physical properties of biomolecules and how they interact with the environment of the cell. So we know that the seven functional groups that are most important in the chemistry of life are hydroxyl group, carbonyl group, carboxyl group, amino group, sulfur hydryl group, phosphate group and the methyl group and they are also rightly called the magnificent seven as they decide the properties of biomolecules. So the carbonyl let us start with the discussion of the various functional groups which are present in variety of biomolecules the first one being the carbonyl group. The carbonyl group is present in carbohydrates and I have taken the simplest example of glucose and fructose. In glucose and fructose the functional group is carbonyl. In glucose it is the aldehyde group whereas in ketones it is whereas in fructose it is the ketone group and then what we find that this molecule has six carbons in it. So glucose is rightly called as aldohexose and ketone is called as ketohexose. So now let us look into what are the properties of this ketonic group. The carbonyl functional group of aldehydes and ketones are generally polar in nature and they will increase the polarity of the biomolecules and their reactivity. Why are they polar in nature? Because as I said in my previous lecture that these group is there is difference in electronegativity of carbon and oxygen as a result of which this oxygen being more electronegative will pull the pi electrons towards itself as a result of which this oxygen will have a negative charge and carbon will have a positive charge. So these are polar in nature and we know that the molecules the biomolecules which are containing carbonyl groups are volatile in nature and stimulate sen senses with both pleasant and unpleasant odors. We know that amylogladylin which is present which is a glycoside and is present in almonds which we call as oil of bitter almonds also has as a and when we carry out the hydrolysis of this amylogladylin we get benzaldehyde and that bitter taste of almonds is because of the uh, of the benzaldehyde which is present in amylogladylin the second group which is present in the biomolecules is the hydroxyl groups and as we can see that this monosaccharide which is the an example of glucose it has five hydroxyl groups in it. So that means these hydroxyl groups will now again modify the properties of sugars and we know because of these hydroxyl groups these sugar molecules are highly soluble in water glucose is highly soluble in water why so? Because it is able to form intermolecular hydrogen bonding with water. So the next thing we have to see is this hydroxy functional group as which is present in alcohols and which is present in carbohydrate it adds to the polarity of the biological molecules. This we I have already explained with an example of uh, glucose. Now another example of alcohols is glycerol and this glycerol is commonly known as glycerine and glycerol is a polyalcohol and it is an important part of triglycerides and phospholipids. It forms the backbone of the uh, triglycerides and phospholipids and the third functional group 
which is present in biomolecules is carboxylic acid group and this carboxyl group is present in it has bo it has both the groups it is made up of a carbonyl group and a hydroxyl group so its properties will be different from that of when it is present in a molecule its properties will be different from those of a carbohydrate or a, I can say that of a carbonyl group and that of a hydroxyl group. It will show its different properties because of resonance between the carbonyl group and the hydroxyl group. And what we find that the biological macromolecules which contain carboxylic groups are often highly polar and reactive. They are polar because of difference in electronegativity of the oxygen and the hydrogen uh, group atom attached to the carboxyl group in case of carboxylic acids. And the common biomolecules which contain carboxyl functional group are fatty acids and amino acids. So now let us first see where are these carboxylic acid groups present. So as I said that these carboxylic acid groups are present in lipids. So when we talk of lipids I have shown what are uh, so this, these are the fatty acids which are the constituents of lipids. They can be constituents of uh, glyc glycerides and what we find is we can have two types of uh, lip, uh, fatty acids. One can be stearic acid which is saturated and then we can have oleic acid which is unsaturated. So here we have written 18 is to 0. What does 18 mean? 18, 18 indicates that this stearic acid has 18 carbon atoms in it and 0 indicates that this molecule is saturated in nature. Whereas Olic acid is indicated by 18 is to 1. Here it shows that it has 18 carbons in it and it there the degree of unsaturation is 1 that is we can see one double bond here. And now as I said the functional group modifies or it is responsible for the chemical properties of the molecule. What we find we know that this hydrocarbon chain is going to be non-polar because there, there the bonds are between carbon and the hydrogen and it is this carboxyl group which will be polar and we say this part is hydrophilic in nature whereas this part which is non-polar is the hydrophobic part and this will be the this is the head and this is the tail of the molecule. That is when we are talking of fatty acid and it is present in a, a lipid. So I have taken here an example of a triglyceride. So what we find that in triglyceride this glycerol forms the backbone of this lipid and this glycerol reacts with three molecules of fatty acids which can be we can say it can be oleic acid, it can be stearic acid, it could be linolenic acid. We have to take, we can take a fatty acid here and a water molecule is eliminated here and we get a ester, triester which is a triglyceride. So what we find that in a molecule of triglyceride we have a alcoholic part from the glycerol molecule and we have a, a part, the carbonyl part from the fatty acid and here now since the reaction is taking place between the OH of the alcohol and COOH of an acid where the H is being removed from the glycerol molecule from the alcohol part and the OH is being removed from the fatty acid we get a ester linkage here and we call it as a triglyceride. So that means glycerol forms the backbone of a triglyceride. Now we go on to phospholipids and the phosphate group is present in lipids. So when we look at the, into a phospholipid we find that this, this is the glycerol part here right. This is forming the backbone and this glycerol part is then attached to a phosphate group and this is also attached to two 
carbox uh, fatty acids which may be saturated or may be unsaturated. So, now we can say a phospholipid is a molecule with two fatty acids and a modified phosphate group attached to a glycerol back backbone. The phosphate may be modified by the addition of a charged or a polar chemical groups. Now, the next functional group, the next biomolecule that we discuss is amino acid and what we find that in amino acid both the amino group and the carboxylic groups are present in it. So, this is the amino group here, this is the alpha carbon and we call them as amino, alpha amino acids and we know alpha amino acids are the important amino acids which are used in synthesis of proteins and it has two functional groups now, one is the amino group and the other one is the carboxylic group. So, what we find that the amino functional group also increases the reactivity of a biological macromolecule and they readily form hydrogen bonds with other polar, mo polar molecules and with water and we know as amines are they are amines are weakly basic but what we know that amino acids are amphotic Amphoteric in nature. Why are they amphoteric in nature? Because in an amino acid, an internal acid base reaction takes place in which this group acts as a basic group and this group acts as an acidic group and there is internal acid base correct reaction here and this will now occur as NH3 positive and this COOH will occur as COO negative. So, we say amino acids are amphoteric in nature because of the presence of the amino group and they and the presence of the carboxylic group and they occur as zwitter ions. And why do they occur as zwitter ions? Because one group that is amino group is modifying the, uh, the properties of carboxylic group. So, there is interaction between these two and they occur as Zwitter ions. So, amino groups and uh, carboxylic groups of amino acids react with each other. Not only this, first what is happening? The amino group and the carboxylic group um, react internally with each other and now the second possibility is that the amino group of one carboxylic acid may react with the carboxylic group of the second amino acid or we can say the carboxylic group of the first amino acid reacts with the amino group of the second uh, amino acid resulting in the formation of a peptide bond. So, this is what I have shown here a uh, amide linkage. So, what is happening in amide linkage when we are talking as I said in the beginning as I have explained that these amino acids because of internal acid base reaction they occur as bitter ions and now this carboxylic group will react with the amino group of the second amino acid and what we find that a OH group will be removed from here and H will be removed from here resulting in the formation of an amide linkage here which we call as a peptide bond. And when we we'll discuss these amino acids in detail what you will find is that the N terminal is always placed on the left hand side and the C terminal always comes on the right hand side because when we are making a simple as I have made a dipeptide here. So, what we find that in this case the carboxylic group of first amino acid is reacting with the amino group of the second ami uh, amino acid resulting in the formation of a peptide bond. Now, coming back to phosphate groups. Phosphate groups are not only present in phospholipids, phosphate groups are also present in nucleic acids and when we say they are present in nucleic acids, now the nucleic acid can be DNA or an RNA and in a DNA, here I have shown the structure of a nucleotide of DNA, what we find that we have a nitrogenous base which is adenine in this case which is heterocyclic base and now this is attached to a sugar and this sugar is a deoxyribose sugar which in turn is attached to a 
phosphate group. So, this is the nucleotide of DNA and this phosphate group when it is present in the molecule it is makes it highly reactive because they are very acidic in nature and the phosphate functional group is also reactive as I have already said. So, these phosphates are essential to the metabolic processes of photosynthesis and cellular respiration involving energy transfer. So, what happens is there is a transfer of phosphate molecule, phosphate group from one molecule to another molecule and in that process it delivers energy in a chemical reaction. So, that means energy transfer in cell is a chemical reaction, it does not involve heat that means the energy transfer here is, here is in form of delta G. So, what we find and another the very very important example is that of adenosine triphosphate which you can see on your screens and when we talk of adenosine triphosphate it is a nucleotide, but this now uh, another example of a nucleotide, but this nucleotide resembles RNA. Why does it resemble RNA? Because it has ribose sugar in it and we know in RNA we have a heterogeneous base a phosphate group and we have a ribose sugar whereas in DNA we have a deoxyribose sugar. So, in this case what we have find is that adenosine triphosphate which is known as ATP in this the adenine and the ribose comes as becomes the adenosine these together and we call it as adenosine triphosphate and as I have said that this phosphate is uh, is helps in carrying the energy or transferring the energy. So, when these bonds will break ATP molecules will transfer the energy in form of what in form of chemical energy therefore, we call ATP as energy currency of a cell. Now, the last functional group that we have to discuss is the sulfur hydryl functional group. Why is sulfur hydryl functional group so important? It is important because it stabilizes the proteins. So, what we find that those amino acids which have sulfur hydryl functional groups in them, they form bonds called disulfide bridges which are SS bonds and they will help to the protein molecule to take on and maintain a specific shape. As you can see on your screens that we have two molecules of cysteine which have a thiol group in them that is sulfur hydryl group in them and they will react uh, together with they will react and an oxidation reaction takes place that is these hydrogens are removed and we get a sulfide linkage between two sulfurs here as you can see here and we are getting a sulfide bond and hence they help in stabilizing the protein molecules and what are we getting here we are getting a cysteine molecule. So, now we know as I have already discussed the functional groups in which are present in molecules. So, now we know that in uh, carbohydrates we have an aldehyde group and an alcoholic group whereas when we talk of lipids, lipids can be phospholipids, lipids can be triglycerides, then we can have lipids can even be steroids that is if I talk of cholesterol, uh, cholesterol it is also an example of a lipid. Then we have uh, amino acids in which we have a amino group and a carboxylic group and then we have DNA, RA, DNA and RNA and ultimately we say that proteins are stabilized because of the sulfide linkages in a molecule. So, now how are these biomolecules or molecules of life made? These molecules of life are made from simple subunits or building blocks called monomers and now these monomers combine with each other using covalent bonds to form larger macromolecules known as polymers. And on the other hand what we find that the organize organisms will utilize the macromolecules for their life processes through hydrolysis. 
so what we find that first the monomers are combining to form macromolecules which can be carbohydrates which can be lipids which can be proteins and now after we have consumed these micromolecules what happens in the body or in the cells the cells will break down these macromolecules by a process of hydrolysis using certain enzymes so now we have two types of reactions when we are synthesizing or when we are making a macromolecule it will involve a dehydration reactions between say two monomer units and in this process a new bond is formed and since a new bond is being formed we know this will be a and uh, this will be this will require energy that means this will be an endothermic reaction whereas when the bonds are broken when we are we have consumed say carbohydrates and now they are being hydrolyzed in the body in that case what is happening we are breaking say starch that we have consumed into say glucose molecules and here what is happening hydrolysis is taking place and what is involved in this case we are simply breaking the bonds between the glucose molecules and what will happen in this process energy is released and this energy can then be stored in form of atp and then atp will uh, supply energy when we need it so that means and these dehydration and hydrolysis reactions are catalyzed by specific enzymes which are you know made up of proteins so what happens in a dehydration reaction the hydrogen of one monomer combines with the hydroxyl group of another monomer releasing a molecule of water and forming a polymer so here i have taken again an example of formation of a peptide bond so what we find here is that the carboxylic group of one amino acid reacts with the amino group of the second amino acid so what is happening here this bond the oh from the carboxylic acid reacts with the hydrogen from the second amino group of second amino acid and it is eliminated as water so what is happening here is dehydration is taking place and a amide bond or a peptide bond is formed here and we get a we synthesize a dipeptide here now on the other hand what will happen when we carry out hydrolysis now we've consumed this protein now our body has to use this protein so what will happen in the body hydrolysis will take place in say uh, presence of enzymes called peptidases now these peptid enzymes will bring about hydrolysis by these polymers will be now a protein that we've consumed will be broken down into its monomers by a process known as hydrolysis which means to remove water and this reaction in this reaction what is hap happened is in this reaction what we find that a water molecule is being used here to split the bond that is the amide bond so what you have to remember is in dehydration a water molecule was being eliminated so that was a dehydration reaction that is when we were synthesizing a peptide a dipeptide say and now when we break it down so how will we now break it down we will break down this dipeptide or a protein with help of water so here we are what we are carrying out we are carrying out hydrolysis so what do we say hydrolysis reaction is that reaction in which a water molecule is used to break the bond hydro means water lysis means we are breaking the bond so what we find that when we consumed as you can see on your screens a uh, protein molecule proteins so what happens this uh, water molecule in presence of enzymes will cleave this bond and you know that water is made up of two parts that is oh and h that is it can act as a base through oh to the lone pair of electrons on oxygen and 
as um, uh, acid to H plus. So, this carbon is electron deficient. So, what will happen? OH will go here and this nitrogen is has lone pair of electrons here. So, H goes here and it brings about the cleavage of the uh, peptide to give us a of a protein to give us a peptide and we will get a amino acid here. So, here we have taken a tripeptide or it can this peptide chain could be long also. So, now what happens is so I have also discussed all the functional groups which are present and which are very important for the biological properties of biomolecules. Now, in my next lecture we shall be starting with the discussion on the molecules of life that is carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and nucleic acids. There I will be just introducing you to the these biomolecules and then we will see that water plays a very important role for the functioning of these biomolecules. After we have discussed that then we will go on to discuss these biomolecules one by one in great detail. So, this is uh, where I would like to wind up my lecture and the books that I have used and which you can also use are um, the Carrie Francis book, then McMurray John Organic Chemistry and then we can also refer to Lehenger's that is principle of biochemistry. These books will also help you a lot. Thank you.